Hi, good morning, everyone, and welcome to St. Stephen's Episcopal Church. Whether you're joining us here in person or on the line, if you're uh, visiting with us today, I don't see any visitors here, but it's always good to go over it just in case you should have received one of these. These have this uh, out handout has everything you will need to worship with us this morning. If you're joining us online, it will be in the description for the video. A few announcements for you this morning. We have, of course, begun our uh, Bible and theology uh, back up. Sunday morning is at 8.15, Bible and theology. Sunday morning is 8.15 in the parish hall. Um, this coming uh, October 24th, Sunday, we have a new opportunity to reach the growing population of uh, southern Grayson County. As many of you know, Grayson County is growing and has been growing. Um, it's a, a sort of a booming housing industry down there in southern Grayson County. We, as, as McKinney and Allen became the bedroom community for Dallas, so we're becoming the bedroom community for, uh, for apparently McKinney and Plano. So the growth is here. People are moving in, and this is an exciting opportunity for us to reach uh, new people in new and creative ways. And one of the ways we're doing that is this special evening prayer service in Howe, they have a little uh, chapel, Summit Gardens in downtown Howe. We'll have an evening prayer service there October 24th at 5.30 p.m. Y'all come join us for that, but more importantly, tell your friends and family. If you know anyone that works on Sunday morning, those of you who join us online that join us later in the week or later in the day because you work uh, right now, uh, you work on Sunday mornings, this is a great opportunity for you as well. So make sure you tell people, tell people in the community this is an outreach and evangelistic service for us. Um, November 2nd, All Souls Day coming up, 6.30 p.m. We will have a service. A few details I will give later once they are fully planned, and we will have a special remembrance for those we have lost to COVID during that All Souls Day service, as well, of course, as pray for all the departed, and we will take uh, names for, for people in your life that have are among the faithful departed uh, soon. The, announcements for that will be coming up. Weekly reminders, Bible study this Wednesday, 6.30 p.m. in the parish hall, continuing our study of 1 Samuel. Jesus Christ said. 
Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord.
Jeff, you are key. Who took me out of the blue? I have been entrusted to you ever since I was born. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. Many young bulls encircle me. They open wide their jaws at me. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My mouth is dried out like a pot stirred. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. The glory of the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark. Glory be to thee, O Lord. The tenth chapter, beginning at the seventeenth verse. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters, or mother, or father, or children, or fields, for my sake and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers, and sisters, mothers, and children, and fields, with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, Jesus has a lot of hard sayings in the Bible. And uh, this one, that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God, probably has to be on that list. There are plenty of ways that I have seen over, over time to footnote or asterisk this in ways that are a little bit strange. One of them you may have heard is this idea that there was a gate in Jerusalem called the Eye of a Needle that would sometimes fit camels through it. From everything I have been able to find over my years, um, this is what we might call an old pastor's tale. 
Uh, it doesn't seem to have really existed. There may have been something somewhere in a book that recommended the idea that it could be possible. And everybody just sort of went from there. It does not appear that Jesus was referring to an actual gate, not one that, was, that existed of some sort. In fact, what we see from the disciples is they don't say, oh, well, we know that it's really difficult to squeeze a camel through, but we've seen it done. No, they respond in shock. Well, who then can be saved, they say. I think Jesus is using an actual figure of speech to refer to something being impossible. He is actually saying it is impossible to enter the kingdom of God with wealth. I think we have to deal with the Bible text, with what the Bible says, starting rule number one. Then, of course, if that's true, what do we do? What's going on? I mean, are all Americans going to hell because we've got wealth in the world? Is that, is that what then the implication is? And I could be just throwing my own footnote on there as well, just like every other preacher does, because none of us want to come to that conclusion. But I don't think so either. Jesus is, however, challenging one very important, or one very pervasive, I should say, idea in the ancient world that is just as popular now as it was at the time of Jesus. And that is the idea, the assumption, that life success, life wealth, and personal health are in some way a direct result of one's personal righteousness, faith, or moral standing. Let's say that again. It is a, it is a false belief that one's personal life success whether it's in terms of one's health or in terms of one's wealth, is somehow directly related to one's personal righteousness, moral acting, or faith. In other words, in the ancient world, they believed a sure sign that God's blessing was with someone, that God had blessed them, was that they were successful in life. That's why the apostles are so shocked. If a rich man cannot enter the kingdom when, subtext, obviously God has blessed them, then they say, who can be saved? Because in that mindset, to not be rich, to be poor, or to be diseased, to have a lack of health, is a reflection of one's faith or a reflection of one's moral character because it means God has not blessed them. And the only way God hasn't blessed them is if they obviously don't deserve it. So if they're poor or if they're sick, it must be because of something they have done, some moral failing on their part, some lack of faith. If they only had faith, God would bless them. And God would bless them with health and wealth and they'd be okay. And therefore, in that mindset, those who are healthy, those who are wealthy, must, of course, be blessed by God. And God would not bless anyone who is not righteous, who is not faithful. So you can see why the disciples are very confused. Why their initial reaction to Jesus is, well then, who in the world can get in? If someone that God has obviously blessed because obviously they're faithful and righteous and just, well, what about everyone else? What about all of us who are currently not successful and currently not healthy because we're obviously sinners? And that's why Jesus doesn't correct them. He doesn't say, no, 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 you don't understand. You know, you know that gate outside of Jerusalem? Yeah, I, I wasn't saying it was impossible, just, you know, really difficult. His response to them is, well, yeah, it is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. In other words, Jesus is completely severing any link in the disciples' mind 
between righteousness, morality, and deservingness, and health and wealth and life success. Jesus is functionally saying they aren't related. You can't read one into the other. You can't look at someone who's doing very well in life, or you cannot look at yourself who might be doing well in life. You cannot look at yourself and say, well, I am wealthy. I have been successful at things I have tried. I have been healthy, therefore I must be righteous. Therefore I must be upstanding. Therefore I must be faithful and this is a reward. And there you see the problem. This is a reward for what I have done for God. Thank God he has me on this earth. Instead, Jesus is saying they are unrelated. You might find someone who is poor. Or you might find someone who is impoverished, consistently so, even have a slew of health problems. And the first will be last, and the last might be first, and they might be more righteous. They might actually be more moral. They might be more faithful. And you can't judge that based on their life condition. It is irrelevant. Jesus is severing that link. There are a whole lot of Christians in America that have been burned out by a certain false gospel of health and wealth that would have probably never been burned out had those preachers read this verse in the Bible along with maybe a few others. Because don't get me wrong, I just, just maybe, maybe be absolutely clear being told, being preached as in the prosperity gospel and the positive thinking movement, all of that, most of the preachers you will see on TV are preaching a false doctrine and a heresy. And yes, I think it is that strong because it sure does hurt a lot of people. It makes a lot of people who are sick or not doing well think it was personally their fault if only they had enough faith when it was never that to begin with. They are not necessarily to blame for their situation. They might just be stuck in a cycle of poverty. They might have health problems. There could be a lot going on, but it's not their fault. God isn't out to get them. It's not a curse. And on the other hand, it gives some people a little bit too much confidence that they obviously are loved by God because they're doing well. They're obviously righteous and moral and faithful because they are healthy. You can have somebody instead whose life has fallen apart. Either their marriage has fallen apart or their health has fallen apart or their finances have fallen apart. And they are saints. Destined to get to the kingdom of God somewhere ahead of the line. And you have people who are, everything is going well for them. They seem to have the Midas touch. Everything they touch seems to turn to gold. But their heart is rotten and faithless on the inside. And it has nothing to do with God blessing them at all. Jesus is severing the link. Jesus is, preached, is the first preacher against the health and wealth so-called gospel. That's why the disciples are so shocked. So he's challenging something they just assumed had to be true. So when the rich man said, what can I do, good teacher? And actually the Greek word there is just teacher, it's not even rabbi. He's not son of David, he's not son of God. He's looking for a wise teacher to give him some new life principles. Five principles from the Bible to help you grow your business. That might be what he's looking for. And Jesus sees that he has at least not broken any commandments. Notice the ones Jesus mentions. What have you done? Oh, okay, fine. You have not murdered. Good for you. You have not committed adultery. You have not stolen. You've accomplished the bare minimum moral requirements. But Jesus knows there's something else. Because if he really wants to be righteous, he can't rely on 
his outward display of health and wealth that has nothing to do with it. He needs to be totally, completely committed to Jesus. The thing the man loves above all else is the stuff he has. So that's the thing that Jesus asks him to sacrifice. For some people, it might be different. For some people, Jesus might ask you to sacrifice your loyalty to your family. Jesus said that before, didn't he? I did not come to bring peace but a sword, to turn father against mother and son against father. If you do not love me more than you love your mother and father and brothers, you are not worthy of me. Jesus was really specific and strong there. He also says, honor your father and mother. You should, you should, of course, love your family. But there's a limit. Jesus demands the higher loyalty. Jesus demands we put him first. Jesus might be asking you to sacrifice your sense of self-worth. Whatever it is in your life that you derive a sense of accomplishment from. That you sit down and you say, I am a great person. I am a good person. I am a successful person because of my education. Because of my skills and talents, because of my stock portfolio, because of my retirement plan, because of where I happen to live, because of this list of things on my resume I have done. But what if Jesus comes to you and says, that's great you did all that. Tear it up and hand it to me. Put me first in your life. I'm asking you to give up that which you find most valuable. What if Jesus demands ultimate loyalty to him? What if Jesus demands give up what is most precious to you? In the rich man's case, his possessions. Because for the rich man, all that stuff he had was his. God had blessed him because he earned it. It was a reward. But it wasn't a reward. It wasn't because he had just earned it. It wasn't even necessarily good because God had blessed him because he was righteous. He just happened to have it, and it was important to him. And that's why Jesus asked him to give it up. Not merely because, not, not because holding money in your pocket is going to send you to hell, but because this man had a completely wrong idea of what it meant to be to follow Jesus. He wanted wise principles to help him be more successful. If he could be more faithful, he could have more success. If faith and righteousness can bring you health and wealth, then you want more ways to be faithful so you can have more health and wealth. And Jesus tells him that's completely the wrong goal. You want to be faithful, give up all that stuff you thought was God's blessing to begin with. Give it all to me. Sacrifice all of it. If you really want to be righteous, there's your problem. You put something above me. And that's Jesus' challenge even today, right? Because we still have this mindset. This health and wealth, positive thinking, prosperity, gospel mindset. It will not go away. And so Jesus is saying to you again, give it Whatever it is you're finding valuable, sacrifice it to me. If you are putting your ultimate trust in your life accomplishments, give them to me. If you're putting your ultimate trust in your education, give it to me. If you're putting your ultimate trust in your resume, give it to me. If you're putting your ultimate trust in the family or the tribe or the community or the nation you were born in, sacrifice it to me. Do not dare put your nation above God. Do not dare put your mother and father above God. Do not dare put your wealth and your health and your life success above God himself. If you want to be righteous, give it all up and follow Jesus. Follow him into the world. Follow him in producing the real fruit of the Spirit. Gentleness, kindness, love, sacrifice, self-control. Working for the common good and not your individual own. 
Not like Satan, who looked to himself instead of to God for his ultimate end. Give it up for Jesus. Be dedicated to Jesus. Follow Jesus wherever he sends you. And no matter what he asks you to do or sacrifice, that's what it means to be a Christian. Not to be a good citizen. Not to just do the bare minimum stuff and don't murder, don't steal. It means you are dedicated in your baptism. You belong to Jesus. Your body, your heart, your mind, your soul. They belong to God and ultimately no other. And our command as disciples is to give it all up for him, to follow him, to make a total dedication every day to him. Even if it doesn't result in health, even if it doesn't result in wealth, even if it doesn't result in success, even if you lose everything around you, if you have Jesus, it will be enough. To him be the glory, and now and forever. Amen.
suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles, and bring them the joy of thy salvation. We pray for all who are ill or have other needs. Linda, Wyatt, Jason, Dominique, Joy, Alan, Charlie, Joel, Craig, Helen, Grace, Jack, Cynthia, Mike, Kim, Fernando, Diane, Kelly, Sarah, Wayne, Warner, Tia, Roman, Charlotte, Lily, Commodore, and the victims of the Timberview School shooting and their families. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. We commit to thy mercy all who have died with faith in Christ, that thy will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Stephen, our patron, and all thy saints, in thy eternal kingdom. We pray for those who have died, particularly remembering that this day, Phyllis, Susan, and Verna. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, who said us unto thy apostles, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Regard not our sin, the faith of thy church, and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city. Where the Father and the Holy Spirit now lead us and reign us ever one God, world without end. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against thee in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved thee with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of thy Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in thy will and walk in thy ways to the glory of thy name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who is great mercy, have promised forgiveness of sin to all those who with hearty repentance and true faith to unto him. Have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the perfect offering for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Let the peace of the Lord be always with you. Here as we spread the gospel of Jesus to Sherman and Grayson County with a donation in the back. If you're joining us online, please uh, make a donation online as well for that. You know, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
the thou of thy tender mercy, didst give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice of oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and did institute, and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of that his precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. For the night which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he gave thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me. And now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercy. We are not worthy so much to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Almighty and ever living God, we must heartily thank thee for the thou dost feed us in these holy mysteries with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and dost assure us thereby of thy favor and goodness toward us, and that we are very members and corporate in the mystical body of thy Son, the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs to repose with thy everlasting kingdom. And we humbly beseech thee, O Heavenly Father, so to assist us with thy grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship, and do all such good works as thou hast prepared for us to walk in. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom we be in the Holy Ghost, be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen.